We are on the second of three sermons, Faith, Hope, and Love. This week is hope. Last week we talked about faith. Hope is a little less easy to access, I think. And we're going to read the lesson that the kids saw so beautifully illustrated just a few moments ago. This comes from Matthew 7, verses 24 through 29. These are the words of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on rock. The rains fell, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was its fall. Now when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were astonished at his teaching for he taught them as one having authority and not as their scribes. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I'm going to tell you, at 9 o'clock, I think I put the whole congregation to sleep, including the preacher. Maybe it was because we had hoped to be outside and we were inside, it was pouring rain, but this is a tough one to access, I think. Now, last week, when we talked about faith, we read this from the letter to the Hebrews. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things unseen. So what's the difference between faith and hope? Now, if you look at the dictionary, if you want to look at um, what hope means, it says, hope is an optimistic state of mind that is based on an expectation of positive outcomes with respect to events and circumstances in one's life or the world at large. As a verb, its definitions include expect with confidence, and to cherish a desire with anticipation. Hope is commonly used to mean a wish. Now, we hear a lot about hope at Christmas time in the church for the first Sunday of Advent, it's the Sunday of hope. But at Christmas time, people are more hoping for what they're gonna get, right? And we're all hoping now that this stupid pandemic will one day be an ugly, ugly memory, but it still seems to roll along, doesn't it? I hope this morning that the sun would shine on our service, and Mike is a prophet, because he called me and he said, you know, it's supposed to start raining about 9.30, and I was thinking, well, maybe if we just try to get the service in, and by five after nine, it was pouring buckets out of the sky. But if you look hope up in a Bible dictionary, you get a little bit of a different meaning. Hope is the confident expectation of what God has promised and its strength is in God's faithfulness. Let me read that to you again. Hope is the confident expectation of what God has promised and its strength is in God's faithfulness. If you look in the Gospels for hope, you get the Old Testament sort of understanding of hope, which is, you know, you wish for something, not something big like not wishing on a genie or wishing on Santa Claus or wishing on a turkey wishbone. It's more about wanting something to be happening. We hope that we'll prevail in this battle. We hope that the crops will be good. We hope. But that's not what we're talking about in the New Testament. And if you look in the Gospels, you really just see hope listed as when it does not pan out. We preach just this past season of the Sundays after Easter when Jesus appears in resurrected form to those around him. There's the story of Cleopas and the unnamed disciple on their way to Emmaus. Jesus joins them on the road and says to them, what are you all talking about? And they said, are you the only person in Jerusalem who hasn't heard what's happened? Jesus of Nazareth, we had hoped he was the one. Their hopes dashed when he was put to death and buried. And they go on to say, we heard some of our women said he was raised, but we don't know whether we should believe it or not. And finally, he's revealed to them when he shares bread with them at the table when they get to Emmaus. But if you want to know what hope means, you have to look in the epistles, because the epistles are full of references to hope. One that we almost read this morning comes from the eighth chapter of Romans. For in hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Raise your hand if you're a patient human being. I'd like to meet one. Pat, you're you're patient. His wife's going, no, he's not. No, he's not. (laughs) Um, It's hard to be patient, isn't it? Especially when you're anticipating something wonderful happening. But why I picked the passage I read this morning, let's look at it again. We're justified by faith, meaning we're made right by 
God's standards, God's forgiveness has taken effect. Christ has come into our hearts and we have turned our lives over to him and to his lordship. Since we're justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand. And we boast of our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope and hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our heart through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. We boast in our sufferings. When I thought of the year we've had, collectively as a nation and as a world with a pandemic that has kept us from each other's company, that has kept us from family, that has kept us from learning in person in schools, that has kept us worried, that has kept us grieving. When I think about that, that's the way I thought that would be a good passage to read at such a time as this. But there's another one that I want to share with you that comes from the first epistle of Peter, the third chapter. But in your hearts revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared, prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Listen to that one again. But in your hearts revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. I gave the 9 o'clock crowd some homework to do since they didn't want to talk this morning. They were very quiet this morning. That's the service where you get to answer back. If you ever thought you wanted to talk back to the preacher, come to the 9 o'clock service. You get to do that. But are you ready to give an answer to that? If someone says to you, why are you a believer? Why do you believe in God? In the 21st century, why do you believe in God when there's a pandemic going on? Why do you believe in God where half the country is underwater and the other half is on fire? Why do you believe in a God who's letting New England experience its first hurricane in over 30 years where they're not ready for that? Why do you believe in a God who lets the temperature climb to 105 degrees in Seattle, Washington, where only a third of the buildings have air conditioning? Why do you believe in a God who lets little children get leukemia? Why do you believe in a God? Why do you have hope? because belief and hope go hand in hand. It's the firm assurance of what will come in Jesus Christ. And we're supposed to boast in our sufferings? Well, some people have suffered. Me, least of most of the people that I know who have been suffering lately. I am reminded so often of what I take for granted when I look at the pictures of churches burned to the ground. Not just the church that is burned, but the homes of its congregation were all destroyed. One congregation, every single member lost his or her home and their beloved church. I don't know how in the world those folks hold on to hope, but I also know that they will be there worshiping on those grounds as soon as they're able to because Christ is their savior. Christ is the rock on which they built their home and their faith. Did you recognize the passage about the wise and the foolish builders? Were you singing the song in your head? The foolish man built his house upon sand. Usually that goes through everyone's head. And we sing it to children, but it is a foundational, no pun intended, part of our faith. Where does this happen in scripture? But in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus has called his disciples, and in some strange mix of hope and crazy, they left behind their families. They left behind their livelihoods. They left everything behind, and they followed him on the strength of his call. And he takes them up a mountainside and a crowd follows. This is before they've seen the miracles. This is before they've seen the signs of who he is. And he says to them those words that he begins with, blessed are the meek, they will inherit the earth. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness. Doesn't feel very blessed to be persecuted, does it? Like it doesn't feel that suffering is something we should boast on. But we can't leave it there because suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us. Suffering can produce endurance. I asked that question today. God bless Rob Hiddle. He said sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't, doesn't it? Isn't that the truth? Because sometimes you hurt so bad or your heart is so broken or you feel so lost that you don't know where to turn. But there are other times when you say, this is where we are and this is where we have to go and I'm going to get there because God is going to get me through. Not I'm going to get myself through. That's that wishing kind of thinking, but hoping is trusting in God's promise in Jesus Christ to always be with us, to walk with us wherever we walk. John asked me from time to time, John McGuckin, where do you go? There he is. He asked me if I found my crucifix yet. Nope, still haven't found it. 
I haven't broken down and gotten another one because I want that one, and I know it's there in a box somewhere in my garage, the crucifix that hung over my bedroom door for years, the crucifix that has gotten me some insults through the years when someone looked at it and said, what is that thing? And I said, that is my Lord and Savior. And they said to me, I worship a risen Lord. I don't need to see that. I said, I worship a risen Lord who died for my sake. When you open your eyes and the first thing you see in the morning is Jesus Christ on the cross, it gives you a sense of what God is able to do because he did not stay on the cross. But every time I walk under that and I leave my room as whiny and bratty as I feel that day, I look at that and I say to myself, Whatever I have to face this day is nothing compared to what God did for me in Jesus Christ. That is what gives me my ability to endure. I've endured a lot the last few years. I've had a lot of loss in my life. But nothing compared to some that other people are suffering. I think of my friend Leslie. I was her pastor when she was just a kid, and her husband, who is deaf, is paralyzed now from the chest down. Cannot sign, and they're trying to find a way to communicate with him. This is Leslie, who just survived breast cancer herself a few years ago, a young couple thinking they had their whole lives ahead of them. He was knocked over by a wave in Ocean City. That's what happened. And he broke his neck and his back, and he can no longer move. And you know what Leslie asked for? She asked for prayer. She has not turned against her faith. She has embraced her faith in these difficult moments because, as we said, Suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character. We are singing some old stuff at this service now that we have the other service. I'm dragging out the old ones. Whispering Hope, we had to go to the 1938 hymnal to find the music to Whispering Hope. Some of you were singing it like you knew it. How many of you knew Whispering Hope? I remember sitting on my grandparents' back porch, my grandmother who was born in 1892, and singing that with her almost every day after dinner. That was one of her favorite songs. She taught me that one. But blessed assurance, I heard y'all singing that one. Fanny Crosby, we all fight over her. The Baptists say she was Baptist. I know she was really Methodist. I know that. Don't know how I know it, but I know it. Did you know the story of Fanny Crosby, the great hymn writer? She's written so many hymns that are just part of who we are as the people of God. I hope, I love new music because I'm not going to tell anybody that, that they cannot if God gives them a tune and lyrics that they're not able to share it because I only like the old stuff, but I love Blessed Assurance. Fanny Crosby, when she was just a very young child, had trouble seeing, and they hired a quack doctor who poured chemicals into her eyes and blinded her permanently. And her faith was astounding because what she said was one day she would be able to see when she got to heaven. The first thing she would see would be the face of her Savior, and that would be worth everything. Look at the words she wrote. Perfect submission, perfect delight. Visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I and my Savior am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above. Filled with his goodness, lost in his love. That is somebody who knows what hope is. Hope is the assurance that one day she will see. One day she will see her Savior. One day we will be in his presence for all eternity. That is character, folks. That is the kind of character that gets you through. So that's the other part of my homework that I gave the 9 o'clock service. I'm going to give it to you, too. I want you to think of the people whose character of faith inspired you. I've told you the story so many times of Miss Betty Stilwell. She was my birthday buddy. Betty died at 86 in 2016. Her birthday was the day before mine, and we always celebrated together as long as I was her pastor and she was able to celebrate. She always said to people, you know, this is my pastor. I'm just a day older than she is. And I've told you this story before, and I'll keep telling it because this is so much who Betty was. Good Friday service came. She sat and sobbed through the service, and I thought it was because her husband, Bob, who had been suffering from dementia, had just been diagnosed with terminal cancer. And I asked people to leave in silence on Good Friday. We were leaving the sanctuary, but I felt compelled to go to Betty because she was just wrecked. I put my arms around her, and I gave her a hug, and I said, is this because of Bob? And she said, no, this is because I am humbled by the depth of God's love for me that Jesus Christ would die for my sake, and I can do nothing but pour out my heart in praise and thanksgiving. That's character. So if endurance produces character, 
What is it that character produces? Do you remember? I've read it to you three times now. Hope. Character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us. So build your house on the Lord Jesus Christ, and the blessings will come down. That's the last verse of the song. We don't always hear that, because little kids like it when the house goes splat. That's what they're there for, the big, the big collapse. When I was in youth ministry in the annual conference for so many years, before Rock, there was something called Youth Assembly, and I so hate that we gave up Youth Assembly for Rock, because they're different animals altogether, and I think we need them both. Youth Assembly was held on a college campus. It was held... Um, sometimes at Western Maryland College when it was before it was McDaniel College. Sometimes it was held at Shepherd University in West Virginia. It's actually how I got to West Virginia because I wanted to be a pastor in Shepherdstown because there was no United Methodist ministry to students. And I ended up in West Virginia, but not there. Because I opened that door and they said, you want to go to West Virginia? We've got a church for you right somewhere out there. But we did this passage with the kids because kids from all over the annual conference different colors, different races, different economic statuses, different backgrounds, suburban kids, inner city kids from Washington and Baltimore, country kids from West Virginia and places like Hereford and Parkton around us. They'd all come together and they'd be mixed up. They didn't like that because you didn't send your whole group like you do to Rock or now it's Wave. You sent the leaders of your group to learn how to get along with other people. And these kids who said, I don't want to be in a group of people I don't know. I'm scared of these people. They're not like me. By the end of the week, we're clinging to each other, saying, I will love you till the day I die. Some of them are still friends, and many of them became pastors through that process. I was the worship coordinator for this event, Youth Assembly. And I did this passage, and what we did was we pulled kids randomly out of the crowd and said, we're going we're gonna to test this theory. And we had them build a human pyramid and the house on the rock, well, the house on the sand went right down, and they knew they were supposed to. But the house on the rock, we had pastors coming out with buckets of water. We were hitting those kids with everything we had, and they stood fast. We asked them, how would you do that? And they said, by sheer will and determination, because they knew they had to stand fast in Jesus Christ. That's character that produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us. The world has disappointed us greatly in the last year, hasn't it? We have watched too many people die and suffer. We have probably at some times been like the, the line that Elaine sang this morning, out of the depths, O Lord, I cry to you. That comes from the Psalms. We've all been in the depths and we have cried out. But thanks be to God, we have a Savior. We have a Savior. We have access through grace to this faith, faith that is born of hope, hope that is born of the promise of God. So don't hope for a pony this Christmas, but hope that Christ, who has walked with you, will prevail and know that it is true. That's where faith and hope go hand in hand down the road together. Next week, Bill gets to preach love. Darn it. Love's all over the Bible. But hope right now is what we need. So here's your homework again. Why? Would you, what would you say if someone says to you, why do you have faith? Are you prepared to give an answer to the reason that you have hope? And the second is, who in your life, who's your Miss Betty? Who is your hymn writer who comes to you and their character inspires your own? Or in my case, whose faith is it that sometimes shames my own? And let me tell you this, if it's been so long since you shared the reason that you have hope with someone else, if it has been that long since you've shared your faith with another human being, then it has been too long, and it's time to start sharing our faith. There are so many people in the world who are living without hope. Give them some of yours. I know you have it in abundance because you have Jesus Christ in abundance. To the glory of God and our Savior, we pray. Amen.